Welcome to the STARS program, seniors taking active roles in society. And now, here's your host, Anita Finley. For those of you who are interested in medicine, uh, as I am, um, this is going to be a very interesting show because it's going to talk about something that you may not have heard about. And as funny as that sounds, um, I know many people, if I said to them, I'm going to a vascular intervention, intervention, interventional radiologist, they would say, what is that? So I had to find the best one here in South Florida, and I believe that Linda Hughes is that. Dr. Hughes has been practicing medicine in this field for a long time, so we want her to tell us exactly what is the, this vascular and interventional radiology. Hi. Glad you came to the show, Linda. Well, thank you, Anita. Good morning. I appreciate the invitation to be here. Um, and you're correct. Um, a lot of people don't know what interventional radiology is. And I think as you and I have spoken about before when we've had symposiums and lectures that I usually will start out the talk by asking a poll of the audience how many folks have heard of interventional radiology. And I guess I'm pleased to know that in the 18 years I've been practicing that there are more and more hands in the audience that, uh, that are being raised now as opposed to years ago. Um, but in a nutshell, if you were to think about radiology, there is diagnostic radiology, which most people are familiar with, which is interpretation of images, reading x-rays, MRIs, CAT scans, ultrasound. Interventional oncology is also a subspecialty where physicians will use high doses of radiation to treat patients with cancer. And then there's interventional radiology, which we have done a diagnostic radiology residency or training, and then we do additional training, a fellowship, where it's using image-guided procedures. So it's minimally invasive, they tend to be shorter recovery times, smaller incisions, and that it's using imaging, and for the most part it's x-ray, but it can also be CAT scan, ultrasound, and even MR, with some of the equipment now is compatible with MR, that we use the imaging to guide us with smaller incisions, smaller instruments to be able to do procedures. So literally, your hands, your hands are still involved. In, in doing this, or is something else involved in getting in those veins? Correct. Um, our hands are still involved, um, <laughs> but I think that uh, you also touch on something in terms of the wave of the, the future, in terms of what's coming down the pike, that there, and I was actually reading in one of our journals this morning that there's more and more work being done with robotic um, in terms of uh, helping with that. But at this point, it's our, our hands and, and our eyes using the instruments. And before, of course, we, we know that people who were having surgery, the doctor cut them open and did what they had to do. So did it go from that to interventional radi radiology? Oh, I think or it's been, it's, it's, been a, it's been a slow transition, and uh, some of the procedures we do um, are done exclusively by us under x-ray and making small incisions. There are other procedures, for example, patients that have aneurysms in their belly, that traditionally it was surgery where you'd be cut open literally from stem to stern, uh, and it would be major, major surgery. And now we work, the interventional radiologists work with the vascular surgeons, and the two of us work together that they'll make small incisions in the groin. And then again, under x-ray, we'll bring in the grafts and the devices and the balloons that we need to repair the aneurysm from the inside out. So it's, it's, it's been a transition, and it's been um, progress, and it's been uh, innovation, and you know, the goal being less invasive. Let's talk about a specific thing that I, I have now having to know about hernias. My husband had a, a double hernia operation when he was in the war many, many, 70, 80 years ago. Uh, just recently, it just popped out a little bit, and the doctor said, just push it back in, don't lift anything heavy, and he seems to be fine. If he needs more help, wouldn't he be better off going to an interventional radiologist than going to a surgeon? But with hernias, that would still be in the realm of, of, of surgeons. And again, it, it could be minimally invasive in terms of laparoscopic or da Vinci, and that's sort of beyond the scope of what we do as radiologists. Um, uh, and, and that's not an unusual question for you to ask, because oftentimes people will ask things thinking, well, I want to be minimally invasive. And there's a lot of things that we can do, but there are a lot of things that still good old-fashioned traditional surgery or laparoscopic surgery um, is the more appropriate treatment. And what is laparoscopic? Laparoscopic is when the surgeons, rather than making a big incision, is they'll um, make little incisions and they'll put trocars in with one to put gas in to inflate the stomach and a second one with a camera so they can see what they're doing with the small camera and then a third uh, port uh, to be able to bring their instruments in to negotiate what they need to do. So um, 
laparoscopy that doesn't involve X-ray, doesn't involve radiology. That would uh, um, some of the surgeons are, are are using that now. So let's go back to your being in medical school. So when you were there, you had choices of a lot of things, and you could have been a um, a lapis a surgeon that did well. That time, I don't think they had lap. I know. I, I guess I'm dating myself too. You're right. We didn't okay, have we it don't at the have time. To do that. But <laughs> but you could have been a typical surgeon, you know, just surgery. True. Or you yep. could have been a gynecologist. <laughs> could yeah, have been anything, a lot of things. Yeah, literally from A to Z. <laughs> right. <laughs> so was it someone that really impressed you that made you do this? become a radiologist, because that's what you became first, right? Yeah, well, I started out, um, well, I was going to do um, internal medicine and had given some thought to doing cardiology. And um, I mean, obviously, all of the subspecialties are extremely important, and they all have their, their role. And it's a question of what you personally are drawn to and enjoy and, you know, a reason to, to get out of bed in the morning and, and, uh, and love what you do, like and, you do. And, uh, and, and to work late and, and uh, uh, to enjoy what you do and you know that you make a difference. Um, and for me, as, as we've talked about before, Interventional radiology, which even in the 18 years I've been working, have noticed a lot of changes and improvements uh, in technique and, and procedures we have to offer. But for me, it's a perfect blend with my personality of it's patient care. Um, so it's meeting the patient beforehand. It's, it's the procedure itself. It's the recovery time. It's the relationship with family members and friends. Um, but it also is, um, uh, in some ways, it's minimally invasive surgery that it's... Um, it's doing procedures and it's technical savvy and it's fingers and it's eyes and it's uh, um, um, coordination um, and it's also technology. And I'd mentioned in terms of just how far we've come along with uh, the balloons and, and stents and, and atherectomy devices and uh, it, it just to me it's, uh, it, it, it's exciting because we, I think short of probably psychiatry, um, absolutely every specialty we interact with whether it's a plastic surgeon assessing a blood supply for somebody that needs a flap, um, whether it's a cancer patient that needs to have a port put in for chemo, or we have treatments that we offer where under x-ray we'll, we'll go in and we'll deliver either medication or little beads that are coated with radiation to treat cancer. Um, uh, we, as you mentioned, we do a lot of vascular work with uh, blood clots, and I think we had talked about before in terms of being the, the plumber of the body, uh, you know, opening up blockages and um, we do an embolization, which is shutting down certain blood vessels if they're hemorrhaging or bleeding, whether it's from trauma or uh, a cancer or a diverticular bleed. Um, so to me, it was the combination of technology, um, the human aspect of, of, of patient care and interaction, and uh, actual doing procedures. So, Linda, where's it going to go from here? Gosh, I think that you know, the, the, the proverbial sky is the limit. Um, I think that uh, for the vascular work, we've got a lot of exciting things that are that are coming down the pike um, that I think a lot of people are familiar with both the cardiac or coronary uh, balloons and stents that we also use them in the periphery and circulation to the legs and to the kidneys and the carotids in terms of going up to the, uh, the, the brain that typically they tend to be made out of the stents are made out of nitinol, which is a synthetic alloy of nickel, titanium, and aluminum, which is where you get the name nitinol. Uh, but there's been a lot of exciting research, which right now they're Nothing is FDA approved, but in terms of what's coming down the pike, uh, bioabsorbable uh, stents that that they're coated with things to help with inflammation and to help uh, minimize scar tissue or recurrence of plaque. Um, but stents aren't perfect either, just like a bypass isn't perfect and that they don't last forever. And the stents can clog up, they can scar down, um, but that these bioabsorbable scaffoldings will do their trick, you know, open up the circulation um, and they get absorbed. Um, so that, if they it, get absorbed, then they're not there. What's what's going to keep? Well, it's 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 done its job. That it's opened up. It's opened up the blood vessel. It's remodeled the blood vessel, and that it uh, that it dissolves. So again, like I said, this is sort of what's what's coming down the pike. That uh, none of this is 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 mainstream right now. That our you know atherectomy, the balloons. Although that we do have some new uh, recently FDA approved uh, drug eluding balloons. That they have them for the coronary circulation, but we have them now for for the legs and for the kidneys and so forth, where when you balloon it, it delivers a medication that uh, helps with uh, um, inflammation and reducing scar tissue um, after you do a balloon. So lots of exciting, lots of exciting things. Well, it is. And, and I know that you're a, a person that loves that. And you're kind of like, you know, the uh, scientist uh, wanting things to be better because you see some things that maybe could be improved. Uh, what, what was your biggest nightmare? You know, when you... 
I don't mean really. When, when something happened that just people come in and they, you think you can do something and it's just not possible. And that must bother you a lot. Yeah. If you're I, a person that wants to get it done right. Yeah, well, I think uh, everybody does. And obviously physicians, uh, that's, our, that's our goal. Um, I think, thank goodness for the most part, that's not the case, uh, that we do have uh, great outcomes and that we're able to, to help patients. And I think that probably no one particular situation, but I think in terms of what um, I do as an interventional radiologist, um, I guess two opposite ends of the spectrum, but both potential, uh, potentially bad outcomes that can be um, sad and, and um, uh, traumatic are one, trauma. We deal with, uh, you might have mentioned when you introduced me that uh, um, myself and my group uh, provide services for Broward Health and that we have two trauma hospitals and that we work very closely with the trauma surgeons. Um, that if somebody is in an accident, whether it's a car accident or um, they, somebody falls down a flight of stairs or there's a shooting or a stabbing um, or an injury where it involves blood vessels, is that we're called in to help stabilize the bleed with embolizing, put in filters to prevent clots from migrating, um, that we work pretty closely with the, the surgeons and that, you know, oftentimes you get bad traumas that it, they just, they don't, they don't make it. And, you know, uh, any, any kind of a trauma breaks your heart, but uh, particularly when you've got you know, young people, you know, a motorcycle accident or a car accident that just being young and careless and thinking that uh, you're invincible. Uh, so that's one end of the spectrum in terms of uh, things that sort of tug at your heartstrings. Uh, the opposite end is, I mentioned, we do a lot of work with cancer patients as well. Um, and that to realize that, you know, patients that you've taken care of, um, that they're at the end of the line. And despite, you know, the best of medicine and technology we have today, that it's it's not enough to, to, to help. Um, you know, or that people come to see you and hoping that you're going to, to have a, an option for them where regular chemotherapies failed and surgeries failed and uh, uh, tradition, the, radi the um, external radiation doesn't work and to say that, yes, this is a great procedure, but you're not a candidate. You know, you've, you've lost the window or, you know, your, your cancer is, is too far advanced that you're not going to benefit from the procedure. So those are the things that, uh, you know, you, you go home at night and think that, about that. You're that was my next question. So when you run into these things, I mean, oh, knowing you're very sensitive, you know, how, how do you move away from that, even though you didn't know the person? I mean, I guess, how, what, what do you say to yourself? Well, you don't move away. From, I guess that, uh, that doesn't make you human. And I guess the day that uh, you feel that you can just brush it off is the day you need to hang up the, the, the white coat. Um, um, it, it, it bothers you. Um, um, but I think that it's also important, uh, you know, in situations like that where you may technically not have something to offer in terms of a procedure, but to be there in terms of being supportive to the patient and to the family in terms of whatever arrangements need to be made, whether it's another a second opinion, even somebody in my specialty, whether it's um, help with hospice, whether it's um, um, people from out of town and they need a recommendation for even a place to stay. I mean, it just it's it's about taking care of the, the human aspect as well. I mean, the, you know, the, the medicine and the science and the x-rays and the balloons and stents and the, the beads are all exciting, but it's, it's the whole, the whole package. Uh, is this prefer, is this particularly a male's, um, purview? Are there many women doing this as you? Um, it is a male dominated specialty. Um, I think that, uh, when I started for our society, which is, um, SIR, which is the society of interventional radiology, um, we had, I think, 4% of us were women. Um, and actually, I was asked to give a, a talk on that a few years ago, so I knew that that number had stuck out in my head in terms of uh, uh, so few women. But uh, uh, there's another gal named Ann Roberts um, who actually got one of our uh, prestigious awards this year at our annual meeting, and she's uh, chairman out at um, uh, University of uh, California at San Diego. Um, and she had uh, published some work recently, and I think that it's... it's as high as eleven percent now, um, but we are we are double digits uh, that there are more women uh, going into it, and it's it's also it's a relatively new field, um, and it's radiation, and it's you know we wear lead, and that you try to be protective in terms of our being in the room, but you know for a lot of women too, um, in, in terms of having families, uh, in terms of exposure to radiation, um, in terms of the hours with with call, uh, that they may not be things that were necessarily appealing to. Uh, I, I don't want to speak for other women, but necessarily appealing to. Um, uh, to a lot of women, but that is changing. As is the number of women going into medical school. 
Of course, um, because yeah, we all, now we, it's just kind of like 50%, and we know that, but yeah. you're right, for so many, 50 years ago, and I know that wasn't. So I want you to bring up that radiation part. Um, how does that affect you, and how are you able to to protect yourself? Um, well, I think, you know, common sense. Um, you know, we, we joke about people being, you know, um, you know heavy on the pedal uh, because we do step on a pedal uh, for us to use uh, the, the radiation to see what we're doing. But the equipment uh, as well has gotten, uh, um, is also much more advanced. You know, there are certain companies, Toshiba, Philips, Siemens, uh, uh, GE, that are some of the main companies that we work with. Um, and they are constantly uh, working on things to reduce dose, uh, whether you pulse it, uh, you know, intermittent. Um, you know, you're able to, to cone down your field. Um, uh, for us as operators in the room, whether it's a, a nurse and technologist that are part of our team as well as the physicians, we all wear uh, lead skirts and vests um, that uh, we try to be very mindful of uh, radiation um, and that we have uh, monitors, uh, dosimeters that we wear that every month, and it's a national uh, database that they collect. So even if you were to change jobs or move to another city, there's a national database that tracks how much radiation we're exposed to um, during the course of our, our uh, you know, professional career. Talking about that, I just read an article that someone said, uh, you should not be having mammograms. You should have um, uh, ultrasound. Yeah, ultrasound and also thermography. I think they were mentioning that. And so, again, so what do you think about that with um, with radiation? It's a very low dose, and and I don't I don't know. How do you feel? I mean, you have to well, be careful what you're saying now, too. Of yeah, course. exactly. I, I mean, that. yeah, the, the mammography and women's imaging is something that uh, again in training I had spent time with, but uh, haven't kept up kept up with that in terms of the. The, the, the nuances, um, although I had my mammogram last week, um, trying to be the, the good patient as well, and um, I still think mammography has a, ha, has a role. And I have to disagree with some of the comments or suggestions or mandates uh, in terms of screening at a later age. I mean, I, I take care of patients that, uh, and again, unusual, but I've had patients in their 20s, patients in their 30s. Um, I think mammography, um, in conjunction with ultrasound, as you said, there's some of the newer sexy technology that's coming along in terms of the 3D and the thermo and um, MRI certainly has a role as well, um, particularly with women that have uh, um, implants dense, yeah, dense and dense breasts. breasts. Yes. Um, but I think that uh, um, it, it, it certainly has a role. So it's a, right, and I'm sure when, you know, radiation is some, there's a word, it's not the health radiation that you're dealing with. We think of radiation there and Iran, and, and they were always talking exactly. about that, but it's, it's not the same. Yeah. And, and you are exposed. I mean, whether you go for a CAT scan or the chest X-ray or a barium enema, um, it, it, it's radiation. Uh, but you also get radiation being outside. You, know, you get radiation flying from here to New York or to, to, to California, depending on you know, the, the, the flight and the distance of the flight. That's more radiation than you get with some of the tests that we do. Right, and so I all things a, are relative. I have a... Uh, uh, stepdaughter who lives in California, and of course she's one of the hippie women, and she just hates when I use the microwave. <laughs> <laughs> well, and we use microwave for our technology as well. We have um, that's another thing that I didn't mention that we use microwave for burning certain tumors in the liver, in the kidney. Um, again, using imaging to guide us, but we have probes with the microwave that will heat up the tissue to a certain temperature, and it burns it burns the, it burns the cancer. So. Oh, that's something. So I'm not telling her about that. <laughs> not the same microwave you know, as you're eating no, no, your cup of coffee. No, we're not talking about coffee, microwave but... and, and what's going on <laughs> with that. All right, so we said some of the bad things. Now tell me about some cases that just stand out that were so exciting and that you uh, going in said, I don't know if this is going to work, but let's try it, and, and the result was astonishing. Did anything yeah. come to mind? Well, I think that we have um, uh, a lot of the work, as you had mentioned, is vascular work, and we work very closely with wound care specialists, you know, physicians with vascular surgeons, um, and that um, um, it's always gratifying when you have a patient that, and as we've talked about before, oftentimes I get patients that are very far along in the process. Um, so it's, um, it, it's difficult to be able to, you, you want to modify risk factors. If somebody's a smoker, stop smoking. You know, if you're obese, lose the weight. If you're a diabetic, control your blood sugar. If you're hypertensive, you know, exercise and, and, and make sure you're taking your medications. Um, you can't change the fact that you're a male over 50. That's a risk factor. Um, you can't change your family history, but there are certain things that patients have control of and they need to, they need to, they need to take responsibility. Um, I get frustrated when patients come in and 
I'm going to continue to smoke and I'm going to continue to, you know, to be morbidly obese and I don't care what my, my, my blood sugar is, but you're going to fix my blockage. And when I come back in a year and that stent's blocked up, it's not my fault. It's your fault for not changing your lifestyle. Um, but so, so I end up meeting a lot of folks that are pretty long, uh, far along in the process that come in with ulcers or gangrene or wounds on their, on their, uh, on their feet. And it's a question of delineating a level for an amputation. Are you going to lose a toe? You're going to lose your foot. You're going to lose your leg. Um, so it's gratifying when we have patients where we can work with uh, the other specialists and be able to open up blood flow and be able to treat a cellulitis or an abscess or an infection. Again, working with the podiatrist as well, that it's a, it's a multidisciplinary uh, approach. And regardless of what I do from head to toe in terms of our different um, procedures, is it is multidisciplinary um, that you work in conjunction with internal medicine, or podiatry, or vascular surgeons, or the gynecologist, oncologist, nephrologist. To mention short of psychiatry, you know, we work with just about every specialty. So I think things that stand out is to be able to help somebody heal a wound that they're not going to lose a limb, um, to be able to, you know, work with a cancer patient and to have a, a great outcome, um, you know, to have a trauma patient that you didn't think was going to make it and, you know, made it. A woman that bleeds is bleeding after she has a, a, a baby. You know, and, and they're a young woman and want to have, have more children. In the olden days, you know, the, gynecologist, the obstetrician would do a hysterectomy right then and there. If we're in-house, the, the, the interventional radiologist, they can call us. They can embolize or cut the blood flow off to the uterine arteries, stop the hemorrhage, save the uterus. So, oh, that's pretty exciting. Yeah. Oh, that, that is so, great work. So it's hard to point out one thing, as I say, because there's just so many things where I feel like we make a difference. Right. And uh, when, so because you're working with so many other specialists, do you, before you have the case, you have to sit down and work out like a plan and who's going to do what and what, what you're looking at, or you just go, all go in and you just know what you're doing? Yeah, typically for the most part, our procedures, you know, short of a trauma, um, are elective and that they're scheduled and so that you have a chance to meet patient and family, to speak with their primary care physician, any specialists that are involved, um, because sometimes what I have to offer isn't the best thing, um, or it would be a combination of my doing something and then allow a surgeon to do something for them to have the best outcome. So that for the most part, is that short of a, a trauma or an emergency, um, most of what we do is elective or semi-elective and that we're able to, to plan it in terms of doing what we think is the best thing for the patient. Is there pain, a lot of pain, when you're working on them, the same as if it were surgery or, or is it minimal or do you No, do you actually, differently? yeah, that's a good question. Is uh, with them being minimally invasive techniques and procedures um, that we typically... Um, the incisions are small, the recovery time is less, um, but most of what we do is done under a, a twilight sedation, what we call a moderate sedation or a twilight, um, where that they're not completely under with general anesthesia. Some of the, uh, the procedures we do um, for patient comfort or for if they have other comorbid health issues, the safer thing is for anesthesia to be involved, but the vast majority of what we do is a little bit of twilight sedation, uh, because for the most part, what we're working in, there, there are no nerve endings. I mean, there's no nerve endings inside blood vessels. So if we're ballooning or stenting or doing a rotor rooter, you can't feel that because there's no nerve endings. Um, but you do get a little bit of sedation in terms of the anxiety factor and, and being comfortable on the table. Wow. So this is, um, you know, and I know that now from other physicians that the paperwork is enormous. So I know sometimes you know, we joke we spend more time with paperwork or now with computers on the electronic records and charting and documenting that, uh, um, which I guess is, it, it's here to stay, um, but it is frustrating because it's time-consuming. Um, um, what was it like before? Let's say, let's go back 10 years. You didn't have this kind of paperwork. What was it? Well, there was always paperwork. Um, and, I, and I joke with patients when they come in, too, that uh, bear with me because I usually have a minimum of eight sheets of paper that we have to fill out, and we're supposed to be a, quote, paperless system. Um, so I think that uh, there's just more and more paperwork and I think for, for patients as well I mean I know even like I said registering for my mammogram last week you know just signing this and signing that and double checking this and uh, between insurance and 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 waivers and it's it's, it's unfortunately the, the day and age that we live in and practice in and so um, so you don't I, I was thinking isn't it, wouldn't it be good if you had someone standing there and you could just say what was happening or put it into a you know, some sort of a um, computer, and then it just auto automatically records it? 
Is that too far fetched? That's a double edged sword, and it's not oh. too far. It's not too far fetched uh, because actually, for for example, with radiology, as you mentioned, whether we're a surgeon or radiologist, we dictate. You dictate notes. You dictate procedures. You dictate reports, um, and that there are some um, voice recognition packages and software that's out there. Um, but it is, uh, it's uh, it, it is a long way from being um, uh, perfected. Uh, and I know that there are some places uh, that are using it. Um, obviously, it's cost savings because you're eliminating transcriptionists that are physically sitting in a room down the down the hallway transcribing. Um, um, but the problem is, it's a, it's a computer, um, and it's 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 software. And no matter how much you practice, you know, when I'm tired, my Boston accent comes out, um, and I'm packing the car and saying <laughs> funny things that uh, that uh, that that Karen, my transcription gal, will know what I'm trying to say, but but uh, the voice recognition won't. And, I mean, the most bizarre things have shown up when we had played around with using voice recognition and thinking, how is this even in a medical software package? I think, I forget what I had uh, tried to d- dictate once, something something about there was no pneumothorax, and it came out, the aircraft carrier has landed. And th- <laughs> and another one was the fish is in the bowl. I'm oh, thinking, yeah. where are you getting? Yeah. Where are you getting that? Right. And it, it it it's it's time consuming then for the physician. It takes away from time with the patient because you're going to have to go back and edit and make the corrections. Yeah. So it's it, it's coming and it's it's but it's it's not perfected at least from my opinion. Um, my husband has macular degeneration in one of his eyes, and once every seven weeks or something, he has to go and have a shot in his eye, which has really been keeping it um, under control. But I hear the ophthalmologist giving instructions. So low, I cannot, he's saying seven hours, and I'm, I, she, this woman's in there writing as fast as she can, in a dark room, no less. <laughs> and I don't know how it all comes out, but somehow she's pretty experienced at it, so it does work. Uh, Linda Hughes, I'm sorry, I got so involved with what you were doing, I didn't tell anybody. Okay, so Linda is a... Um, a radiation oncologist and no, I'm sorry, inter- radiation inter- in- inter- interventional, interventional radiologist. radiologist. You see, that's, <laughs> it's I know, I know, interventional radiologist, and uh, you can reach her at nbradiologist.com. I guess it stands for North Broward Radiologist.com, and uh, she's also affiliated with Broward Health and all the hospitals that all those wonderful hospitals. So thank you, Linda. I always hear, know, learn so much more every time you come. It's as though I've never met you before, and I always walk away with my mouth open. Thank you for all the work you do and all the people that you take care of. Well, thank you, Anita. You know I enjoy spending time with you as well.